Okay, so uh, today we have uh, uh, Professor Jonathan Leach uh, from Harriet Ward University in uh, Scotland. And uh, uh, so this is supposed to be this quick talk, quantum uh, information and coherence talk. Uh, this will be half of it at least will be at the tutorial level so that people can understand. And again, if anybody has any question, uh, feel free to interrupt at any point of time. So just a brief intro about uh, Professor Leach. So uh, he has his uh, undergraduate degree from University of Manchester in England. And then he has also has his uh, Master of Science, MSCI, which is same as Master of Science, is, is that? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. So uh, it's just a Master of Science degree in physics. Uh, in India, we call it MSC. I think in US they call yeah. it MS. So uh, yeah, so Master of Science in Physics from University of Glasgow uh, in Scotland. Uh, then he actually had some uh, industry experience working with Lumeric Incorporated, uh, which is a world leading nanophotonics design company. Uh, then he decided to switch back and do PhD, which he did from University of Glasgow uh, in, in Scotland. Then he had a couple of year postdoc there again at University of Glasgow. Then he uh, moved to University of uh, Ottawa in Canada to do um, uh, work on a postdoc question there and finally he joined in 2012 he joined the Harriet Ward University uh, in Scotland where the where he is uh, leading a very active uh, uh, research group and his 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 work is most, mostly in uh, uh, classical and quantum optics techniques to solve problems in information science and also nanophotonics uh, optical image uh, sensing and quantum uh, imaging and what he's talking today is imaging at the speed of light. So uh, I, I know Professor Leach personally, and uh, he's an excellent, excellent, excellent uh, experimentalist. So I definitely have collaborated with him and also learned a lot. So hopefully this will be a very, uh, uh, you know, nice talk and we are looking forward to it. So Jonathan, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I've known uh, Professor Ya for, I think maybe 15 years now? I don't know. It's so, long, so many years that I, don't, I, for, I forget to count. Um, but I first uh, met Dr. Ya when he came to Glasgow, when he was a PhD student uh, working in Rochester. And uh, my boss at the time and his boss at the time wanted to work together. And uh, we've kind of worked together ever since and stayed in touch and, and known each other and really enjoyed working together. So. I hope that the work that I present today is of interest to you guys, but I hope that uh, some of the language that I use is, is familiar to you and you will see some of overlap between the stuff that we do in, in Harry Watt here and some of the stuff that uh, is the, the really exciting stuff that you do in, in India. So I'm going to talk today about uh, imaging technology using single photon detectors, single photon detector arrays. Um, and uh, I think that we do some, some really exciting uh, state-of-the-art work uh, uh, using state-of-the-art technology and um, hardware, state-of-the-art hardware and state-of-the-art uh, software stuff. So I hope it's going to be of interest to you. I hope that there'll be some questions at the end, uh, but uh, if there are any questions as we're going, then please interrupt and say. I don't know if I'll be able to see because I'm actually just looking at my screen at the moment. So uh, if there are questions, then someone can, uh, can interrupt me. So uh, my name's uh, Jonathan Leach. I work at Harriet Watt University and uh, I'm gonna to talk today about imaging at the speed of light. So this is my group. Um, uh, there's six of us at the moment. I have one postdoc, uh, Dr. Zhu, and four PhD students, Max, Imogen, Alice, and Sterling. And today I thought I'd take the opportunity to just go through each of uh, the projects that my PhD students are working on. I think that uh, it's interesting to look at it from the perspective of a PhD student and what it is that they're working on. And um, I'll take it in turns and I'll look at each of these. But everything is really around developing technology and using state-of-the-art technology to solve problems in classical and quantum optics. And I, I like to start all of my talks with a, uh, an example of that I have found as being one of the most useful for me. 
uh, which is a question about what does our research and the game 20 questions have in common? Now, I don't know what you guys call the game 20 questions in India, but I'm confident that you have this game. And this is the game where someone thinks of uh, an object, a person, and then you are quizzed about that thing and you're only allowed to ask questions that have the answer yes or no. And this is an example of an inverse problem. And when we start doing uh, academic research or work in industry, we actually face with solving inverse problems the whole very, very frequently. And an inverse problem is really just one where you have a set of data and you need to work out what it was that created that data. So if we play this game, uh, there are, are questions that are asked about an unknown person and we have to get answers and the task is to invert the data and work out who the person is. Um, so if you know who I'm thinking of, then you know the answer to every question. But if you don't know who I'm thinking of, then the answer to any one question doesn't tell you exactly who I am. So it's a set of questions that we need to intelligently ask to work out who that person is. And that actually, that analogy with um, what we do in the lab is, is really powerful because there's some very, um, I don't know, there's some very powerful techniques that we can learn from just looking at how we, like 20 questions. So let's, um, let's go through this. I've, I'm thinking of someone at the moment and you guys have to try to work out who this is. So I'll just, I've, I've set this up already, but we'll, we'll go through it. Okay, so my first question is, are you male? Answer is yes. Are you older than 40? No. Are you Indian? Yes. Are you on TV? Yes. Are you in sport? Yes. Are you in cricket? Yes. Now, can anyone with that amount of information guess who it is that I'm thinking of? Virat Kohli. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anand? Okay. So, so the, we had to, I didn't tell you who it was, but all of that information was sufficient for you to, to get who it was and, and you had to invert that data. And when we think about doing quantum measurements in the lab, you don't often know what quantum state you have, and you're not able to ask the question directly, what is the quantum state that I have? You have to ask other questions about the state, collect information about it, and invert that data to get back to uh, working out who it, who it, that, uh, what the quantum state is. Now, why, why is it, sort of from a mathematical point of view, that 20 questions works. So I could have chosen, if we're limiting ourselves to people, all people that are alive or dead, and that's many billions of people. But there's the, the set of people that I know, and there's the set of people that you know, and then there's a very, very small overlap. So actually the subset of people that I was going to choose from is really, really low. So this is the people I know and that you know, and that's probably gonna be a few thousand. It's gonna be limited to people that are in the public eye. And then if we look at the number of people that you can identify with a binary question, the answer to that is two to the power 20, and then that's over a million. So actually the number of people that we can uniquely identify with binary questions is well in excess <coughs> excuse me, it is well in excess of um, the few thousand that I was, that thought that the, the, the overlap between what, who I know and you know, and therefore solving this problem in less than 20 questions is possible. And what did, what was the, what was the key here? What were other keys here? Well, I was only thinking of one person so we had prior information that our solution was what's known as sparse. So if I write it out as a vector, it was a lot of zeros and I would one just at Virat Kohli. So with knowledge of the solution, 
we can direct our questions and therefore ask them in an intelligent way that provides us with the maximum amount of information. And, and really this principle of taking prior information about the problem that you're going to solve is a really powerful technique moving forward. So I, I really just like starting with that as an example because I think it's something that I return to very frequently. Um, we're often having to solve inverse problems in the lab, taking data and working out what it was that created that data, but we also solve that problem using lots and lots of prior information and that prior information is incredibly valuable. Okay, so I'm going to take in turn to talk about the research of uh, my team here. So I'm going to first of all start with what it is that Max is doing. So Max is my oldest PhD student. He started in 2018 and he has been working on um, optical neural networks and methods for measuring efficiently quantum states and ultimately measuring images and classifying images purely through using light diffraction and controlled interference. So the fundamental question that we're trying to address is can we replace the data in a neural network with light? So there's been a huge um, increase in the uses of neural networks. Um, in daily uses, neural networks are used on all of our mobile phones. Uh, when you do Google searches, we're using neural networks. And there are power and time constraints in terms of the processing that uh, processing the, the data in a neural network takes. So we're interested as to whether we can replace data with light and data can take on um, many values, but light also can take on many values if we think about uh, encoding information in uh, images or the direction or the polarization or the frequency, many different degrees of freedom we have to play around with, with, with light. And just as we can add numbers on a computer, we can add modes of light together and control that through interference. So humans can tell, humans can learn to tell images apart um, and, com and computers can learn to tell images apart, but can we build an optical system that uses light to tell images apart? So this is our deep neural network here, which uh, we've got nodes and neurons. This is the, the, the classical um, MNIST database sorting example, but we're going to try to use light to to replace the data. Now, just to have a, a slightly, take a step back, we're gonna start somewhere else. We're going to start with a question here. How do we make the measurement system that sorts the horizontal and vertical polarization states? I've asked a very, very simple question that we will uh, hopefully know the answer to. And the answer here is a polarizing beam splitter. So a polarizing beam splitter is a system that perfectly sorts between the horizontal and vertical polarization states of light. I put in H or V and I get a click at my detector for H or a click at my detector for V, depending on what my input state here is. And this is something that's incredibly accurate, it's incredibly efficient. I had two inputs and I had two outputs, but this was able to work because at the quantum level, my input states were orthogonal with respect to each other. So I'm just gonna represent this slightly differently here rather than with my polarizing beam switch. I'm just gonna have a, a box that I put data in or light in and I get clicks out of. And in this case, I've got two inputs in and two inputs that are out. And inside that box is my polarizing beam splitter here. So the, the fundamental question that uh, is analogous to what Max has been working on is how would I sort between the horizontal and diagonal polarization states of light? So the problem that we have here 
is that our input states are no longer orthogonal with respect to each other. So my polarizing beam splitter will give me some answers, but it will also give me some mistakes. So uh, it won't work all of the time. And in fact, the, the solution to this problem was worked out a couple of years ago. And there's a very nice solution where we add in a third output to my box. And if that out, third output clicks, it actually provides you with no information about your input state. But in adding that third outcome into the box, it means that we have perfect information if any of my other two outputs click. So now if I put H in and I get a click in the H, I know that I had definitely had that state. If I put D in and I get a click at the D output, I know that that definitely worked. The problem is I just can't, quantum mechanics means that I can't have this happening all of the time. So there is a probability that I get a click in the uh, third output here, which provides me with no information. So what's nice about this is this system never makes a mistake, but it doesn't give an answer all of the time. So that's an important thing. We're trading off our efficiency here for an increase in accuracy. So it's very accurate, but not 100% efficient. And the efficiency of it actually relates to the overlap of our quantum states here. So H and D have a finite overlap with respect to each other, and therefore we can't have this working at 100% efficiency. So oh, uh, question. Yeah, go and. Uh, can you go back one slide that uh, HD? Right, so you said you want a click at that question mark thing and as well as one at D, right? Um, well, it's, it's not that I want it. It's the introducing the third output into this, uh, this box allows a probabilistic um, uh, outcome that carries no information about the state. Okay, so if, if, I'm, if I'm doing this at the single photon level, then I mean, either the number two clicks or number three clicks, the output. Uh, well, one, so one, two, or three could click. Yes. If one clicks, you know your input state was H. Uh -huh. If two clicks, you know your input state was D. If three clicks, you have no information about the state. Okay. But since H and D, if they are not orthogonal, then, okay. The, the second, second input is such that it gets D and D only. Yes, 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 exactly. Okay. So if we, if we, if we come to this example here, Mm -hmm. Like H is H and only H, V is V and only V. Mm -hmm. And here, H is always H, D is always D. Question mark is I'd have, ca it carries no information about either of them. So, it, so if we come to this statement here, it never makes a mistake, but it doesn't give an answer all of the time. Okay, then, then my second question would be, if you already have kind of like a perfect sorter for H and D, I don't know how it would be done, but if, if one has a perfect sorter that can sort H and D, which are, which are non-orthogonal, mm -hmm. then why do I need uh, three, the third? I mean, it, it is already- so, so there, there, is no, there is nothing that will sort H and D perfectly. That's what I thought, okay. Okay, so, so the, there's nothing that will sort H and D perfectly. Mm -hmm. So the solution is to come up with a system that has three outputs. Okay. And I'm not going into what is inside this box at the moment. I'm just setting up this problem mm -hmm. in terms of polarization because we're doing the image equivalent of this. Okay. Okay. Does that, but, does that make sense? So if, if the D is the input, then it has zero probability of ending up in that H output. Exactly. Okay, at, at least that is guaranteed. Okay, fine. All right. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So that's the key here. So if D is the input, the probability of one clicking, output one clicking is equal to zero. The probability of two and three is 
related to the overlap of the, your two input states. Okay. Um, so what we would really like is a system that takes images, puts those into our box and clicks depending on um, what those inputs were. Okay, so, so um, in this case, if I've got uh, nine input states, or sorry, 10, 10 input states, then I'd have 11 output states because I want to have, I'm gonna add in an, an additional unknown answer and adding in this unknown answer increases the probability that I'm correct. We're not actually quite at the stage of doing images yet. Um, we're, we're going to be getting there, but we are at the stage where we can do it with complex uh, superpositions of modes of light. So these are the sort of building blocks of, of light, the, the building blocks of how we would actually make up an image, um, but we have more precise control over them than any particular image. So don't worry about what these input modes are. They are just uh, non-orthogonal input modes of, uh, of light. And as these goes through, what happens is that they, they arrive at different locations on a camera. So it's a bit difficult to see, but I'm gonna go explain it in a little bit more detail. The output modes are no longer on top of each other, they're spatially separated. So it's actually easier to see this uh, in, a, in an example. And we, we solve this problem using controlled diffraction and interference. So this is, this is how the system looks. So you put your modes of light in. So there are th in this case, there are three different non-orthogonal input modes and they bounce off a controlled diffraction grating. And when they come out of this diffraction grating, they are spatially separated. And I will always get a click at the one location when I put in the input mode one. And I will never get a click at the two or the three for that case. But I might get a click at the question mark, which, is, which carries no information about that, uh, that input state. Um, now, here's, a, here's an animation of what those modes look like as they're moving through this uh, inter interference uh, device. So what we've got here is I've got, I'm using color to show the different modes in this case. So we've got input mode one, two, and three in, in red, green, and blue. And they're all on top of each other at the moment. So if I just used a normal camera in this case, I wouldn't be able to tell you which mode I, I had. But as we let these modes propagate, you'll see that the modes interfere with each other in particular ways, and the red, green, and blue are separated at the output of our device. So red comes at the bottom, green comes at the right, blue at the top, and we also have a further one, a further uh, output mode, which is the question mark, which is white in this case, because it carries no information about the uh, state. So I'm just gonna play that again for you because it's just quite nice to see the, the, the light propagating through our system. So because our modes here are spatially separated, we're able to use a camera or a single photon detector placed at each of these locations to record those output states. So can the, I, the can way that we question. Yeah, please do. Uh, in your previous slide, yeah. uh, what, what amount of light goes into each of those uh, spots? Ah, okay, so, so- How so, many photons? So, so, so that's a really good question. Um, it depends on how orthogonal your input modes are. And you have to design your, your, map, your, your interferometer for a particular set of modes. So let's take the case where um, your input modes were perfectly orthogonal. Then it would be that you could sort those 100% of the time and you would 
have in this case, every time you have input mode one, you get a click at the detector one. However, if you've got a finite overlap, so let's say all of your modes have a 50% overlap with respect to each other, then that means that the question mark will have to click 50% of the time because you don't, won't be able to um, uh, distinguish them. Okay, so if I actually go to the next slide, it might make a little bit more sense to you. But the, 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 the answer to your question is, it depends on how much your modes are, are overlapping with respect to each other. I see. So in the previous case of your uh, diagonal, H versus D. Yeah. So the other diagonal is completely being ejected. Uh, so in that, in that case, the and that, that was a case where I had, had knowledge that my two input states were H and D, and we were ignoring the anti-diagonal case. So I don't actually know what would happen in the case where you put in the anti-diagonal. Now, obviously, I can decompose things over a particular basis, but the, the way that we're thinking about this is that we have knowledge of our input states here, and they are non-orthogonal. So it's just H and D in that case. Yes, Thanks. Mm -hmm. So, so th this might help you here. So this is, these are my input modes. This is my neural network, optical neural network. These are my output modes. And this is the, uh, the measurement confusion matrix um, that gives you an idea of how often the question mark would click in this case here. So we don't have modes that are very strongly overlapping here, uh, but if they were more and more overlapping, then the question mark would be, would be brighter. Um, and what this allows us to do is ignore, uh, if we want to sort of work out the, the accuracy for classification, we ignore the question mark. And then we can look at how good we are at classifying just the modes that we are interested in. And we get greater than 95% uh, for classification. Um, and it, all of the system also works for images. So these are the uh, non-orthogonal uh, non images that we've uh, been able to sort with our system. So we've got a smiley face, a frowning face, and I uh, uh, don't know what that one is, a straight, straight mouth. And if we look at the output mode, so these are actually experimentally measured in the lab, you'll see that the question mark always lights up but the correct mode, so one, then two, then three, lights up uh, in the case where we, we, we put, just put in uh, those, those particular modes. And if we measure the uh, confusion matrix for this, so this is how often we're able to predict which image we have, we have uh, greater than 96% uh, confidence every time. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what Max is doing. Well, I will... One question. Yeah, please. Or, or if, if you want me to wait till the end, that's okay as well. But... No, 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 just ra I'd much rather talk about it now. Fine, uh, uh, if you can go back one slide. Yeah. Uh, so you're saying this is a method, I mean, suppose you don't have the possibility of that question mark output. If you just have three input, three output, then yeah. is it that you will not be able to sort them out? Oh, you'll be able to sort them, but you wouldn't be able to do them with this level of precision and this level of accuracy. Okay. Any fundamental reason for that? I mean, why, like does, the, why does having an extra output, why does that help? I mean, it looks like whenever you get the answer, the answer is perfect, but may, many times you don't get the, you know, it, it's a confused answer, so that you reject. But when you get, do get the answer from one, two, three, that is just perfect. Yes. But the question is, if I have three, three input and, and insist on having just three output without the question mark, yes. is there any fundamental yes. reason why I should not be able to do it? Well, think back to the polarization example. If I've got the two input states, H and D, mm -hmm. so two non-orthogonal states, quantum mechanics says I cannot sort those because yes. the, the D state mm -hmm. has the, the, is, is made up of H and V. Correct. Right. So it, it just, it, if you can, if you could think back to the polarization example, mm -hmm. that's the easiest way of understanding why you cannot have 
two outputs that sorts those perfectly. Okay. Okay. At, at a single photon level. Okay. Okay. But then why does having the third one or extra one, why does that help? I mean, I, why does it, I mean, uh, the, the, the intuition I have is it's, it's a location to put the errors. I see. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so in the H and D example, you're going to make some mistakes. Mm -hmm. The third output is a location to put those mistakes. Okay. Okay. That's, that's my, my best example. Okay. So then having, having two, uh, two question mark bin, I mean, that, that won't help. I mean, one is where you put all the uh, kind of errors. Is yep. this, okay. Okay. So in, 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 in the implementation thing, I mean, uh, this is a multiple kind of diffraction. So, yeah. so I'm guessing that you're assuming that you're not losing light uh, when you go from one diffraction to the other one. It's like, the, I mean, in, 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 in simulations, you don't. In practice, you do it with a spatial light modulator that is 80% efficient on every reflection. Mm -hmm. so, so, so this is how we actually do it mm -hmm. in the lab here. So mm -hmm. if every reflection off of my spatial light modulator is 80%, then it's 80 to the power of 4 efficient. Mm -hmm. So, okay. but, but, but we don't... We're, we, we sort all modes at the same time. Okay. 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 Right. So, okay. so, so in principle, you're correct. There isn't any, there, it should be a hundred percent efficient. And if we, if we had a specific, um, you know, diffraction grating that was designed for a particular system, then we would be able to get higher efficiencies than our spatial light modulator. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's, a bit, it's a bit frustrating because we kind of want to do this at the level of single photons and we'd like to be able to do this for quantum measurements and program like the, the, measurement out, the measurements that you'd like to use for like uh, bell tests, but it suffers from a overall not particularly high diffraction efficiency in, in practice. Okay, okay. Just because of the multiple bounces. Okay. One one last question. Suppose you have the orthogonal states, then I think I won't need that question mark bin. So can exactly. this methodology can this methodology be used for sorting the like large number of OAM modes? I mean, is that yes, yes. So the the, the, the technique that we're using is uh, based on this thing called a multi light plane multi plane light converter, which was invented, I guess, or really pushed by uh, Joel Carpenter. In Queensland, and I'll I'll send you the link to his stuff. So they've recently published last year, uh, sorting many many hundreds of Lagrange Gaussian modes. Okay, that's a nature nature communication. I think I've seen. It's it. the nature came one, yeah. Okay. 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 So. Okay, moving moving on to uh, what Imogen is working on. So Imogen is working on trying to track light in air as it propagates in free space using ultra fast um, single photon detection uh, technology. And we're using single photon detector arrays for this and she's actually moving on to using nonlinear optics. And uh, I've just got this picture, this 3D picture of light moving around in space somewhat trying to show you what that photograph shows. And you can kind of just see very, very faint laser pulses. Um, that was actually taken with my, with my phone. Um, and my phone has sensitivity that you can see the, the path of the light, but not the pulse as the pulse actually goes. Obviously, uh, the light is traveling at the speed of light and therefore uh, it moves extremely fast. But the the, the temporal resolution of the latest single photon detectors is sufficient for us to actually measure and see, th see this. So as part of the um, uh, UK's quantum technology program, we've been using cameras with effectively uh, a frame rate of 20 billion frames per second. And 20 billion frames per second is fast enough for us to see What's uh, what's going on? What we'll see see light moving? So this is 
a video of, that we took in the lab a couple of years ago, what you're seeing here is light actually propagating across the field of view of the camera and bouncing back and forth between the, the mirrors. So this is light that comes in from the right hand side, scatters off air molecules, bounces off the mirrors, and then exits on the left here. And quite importantly in this work, the camera and the light are um, at 90 degrees with respect to each other. So the, the, the light is always propagating transverse to the uh, axis of the optical axis of the camera. And we've been working on methods for more general light in flight work uh, with imaging. So this is how it works. You have a camera here and you have a laser and you've got your mirrors and you've got light bouncing off of those mirrors, but some of the light actually scatters off air molecules and some of that light makes it to the camera. Meanwhile, there's a trigger from the laser to the camera which starts little clocks, little stopwatches on each of these pixels. And when each pixel sees a photon, the, the, the timer stops and then we're able to record the time of arrival of the light. So the cameras are able to see light moving all, with, a, with, a, with a resolution of around a couple of millimeters. Certainly centimeters is really, really quite, uh, quite easy. Now, there's a challenge though when light propagates um, not, parallel, not, not uh, perpendicular to the camera, but towards or away from the camera. So I'll try to illustrate that with this video. So we've got a pulse of light here that's moving towards the camera. And it scatters. And that scattered light makes it to the camera and then makes it another scattering event which makes it to the camera. So I'm just going to rewind and I'm just going to play this um, slowly for you. So the, the light comes in, the, the, the laser pulse is moving. We make our first scattering event and then that light propagates and then makes it to the camera at that time there. But meanwhile, we have another scattering event at another location at a new time. And that scattering event makes it to the camera, okay, at the time that it gets there. Now you can see here that these two wavefronts are very, very close together. So the time that the camera records in terms of the difference between the first wavefront and the second wavefront is really, really small. Even though the light has traveled a very, very large distance, not very large distance, but it's traveled a large distance. So we've got this first event that makes it to the camera. We've got the second event that makes it to the camera, but the time between those two events is shorter than it would have been in real life because the light is traveling towards the camera. And that means that you get relativistic effects when the light is moving towards or away from the sensor. Okay, so I don't know if I've explained that very well, but it, it, hopefully you, you can see that. So when I, when I look at the data that our camera records, what you're gonna see is that all of the pixels on the camera almost light up at once. All of them light up at once and then they all go away because the time between the, the, these, these two different uh, wavefronts uh, is very, very short. And that leads to us recording that the effective speed of light in this case is much, much higher than the true velocity of the speed of light. Now that's okay because we're not actually looking at one photon, it's a scattering event and it's the time between successive scattering events, but it appears as if the pulse of light is moving faster than the speed of light. When we look so at I'm the- um, Yeah, please. In that, in your plot, the, the two dimensional plot that you just showed, yep. why is only one row lighting up? Oh, just- What, what does that mean? Uh, Oh, um, one row is, is lighting up because the camera is 
imaging one like the, the pulse as it's propagating across the field of view here. So this camera is actually imaging this location here. And does that make sense? It does. Yeah. So if we look at the light going away from the camera, oh, it's not playing for some reason. That's not very smooth. Yeah, it doesn't matter. You, you, you find that when light goes away from the camera, it looks like the, the time between the events is much longer than it would have been and then it should be so if i play you the the, the show you the data for this it should appear quite different than the uh, the towards data so here you're actually seeing the light propagate across the camera and it appears as if it's moving much much slower so there's, we're one of a number of people that have worked on this. Uh, there's a couple of papers on the propagation of light in, in four dimensions. Um, where you can actually look at the specific data that you have, invert that data, and then recreate the full trajectory of the pulse in three, in three dimensions and um, correct for the intensity effects that you would see. So, we published last year, actually, no, this year, uh, intensity corrected 4D light in flight imaging uh, if any, in, in Optics Express, if anyone would like to have a, a look at, at that. So Imogen, who is working on this, she's now actually moving on to trying to do optically gated light in flight imaging, where we're using nonlinear optics rather than a SPAD camera to provide the, uh, the gate for the, the, the imaging that will allow us to get down to um, micron sized uh, re micron resolution rather than millimeter and centimeter resolution which the SPAD camera provides. Okay on to Sterling. So Sterling is please, trying one, to... One quick question. Yeah please. So uh, this was when you were imaging the scattered light, but what, what, what about imaging just, in, uh, let's say the pulse of light is, is, I mean, for that you will not have this kind of effect, right? I mean, pulse, part of the pulse will be arriving at the camera. I mean, there will be a front of the pulse and end of the pulse. So for measuring the pulse, is that any issue or I mean, can it do it effectively? Well, so, so if you, so measuring the, measuring the, like the, the, the temporal profile of a pulse you can do with nonlinear optics. So like a, a frog system will give you the, um, the temporal uh, characteristics of an ultra fast pulse of light. Mm -hmm. um, but there you're going directly onto the sensor rather than using scattered light. Mm -hmm. So imaging is typically always done with scattered light. And the fact that we were able to do the light in flight was because we had a camera that was sensitive enough to see single photons scattered from air molecules. Mm -hmm. So if you want to use direct light, then yes, absolutely, you can do these things. The camera wouldn't have a temporal resolution that is fast enough to see anything less than nanosecond pulses. So it certainly couldn't do characterization of femtosecond pulses. Um, but nonlinear optics, uh, where you're using your uh, your actual pulse to do the gating uh, provides a significant increase in the temporal resolution. Okay. So yeah, you're absolutely right. You could use direct light, um, and uh, yeah, that it, it just it would be difficult to do uh, imaging applications because imaging applications normally use scattered light. I see. So yeah, I, I, I was thinking in terms of uh, single photon. I mean, if if the single photons or few photons are in the you know form of pulses, then uh, I mean. I mean, then of course, camera will not get as much light. It'll still be at the few photon level. Yeah. But but you're saying for uh, doing the direct imaging, maybe the frog system or toad, whatever you know, swamp yeah. imaging, uh, th those will be better, or is it? Um, no, I'm just saying it's different. It's different. Um, I don't know if those work at the single photon level, though. Sorry. I do not know if the frog system works at the single photon level. I'm not sure. It, it, it should do. There's no, there's no reason for it not to. Um, people have done um, uh, nonlinear, nonlinear, uh, nonlinear 
processes with single photons. It helps if like your signal is a, like your, your pump and probe, but like if one of them is an intense beam mm -hmm. rather than an intense pulse, rather than both of them being single photon. Um, but no, it, it will work. It just might take a long time to okay. ac accumulate the data. Okay. So you can actually, I mean, we're, we're quite close in the lab at the moment to doing, like we can do transmission images. We just want to get scattered images and the, 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 uh, the intensity from this, the transmission images is, is, is high enough. We just want to now go to transmission images, sorry, uh, scattered images. Okay. Another a small question. Uh, yeah, please. Something which uh, Anand's question brought up. So, uh, so I understand that in your system, where you image the path of the light, you don't use any lens at all. It's just time of flight, right? No, no, there is there is a lens on front of the camera, which is important. In a, otherwise, you would just see the scatter light from everywhere. So we need to form an image on the on the sensor. So if you're forming an image on the sensor, so in the same case that you spoke about, you know, a pulse moving, which has a component of K towards the camera. Mm -hmm. So would, would dead time not be an issue or? So in this case where the light is moving towards the camera. Two, the if two photons reach at the same, the same pixel at the same time. So, so yes, yes, that would be, but if you think about this, we've got a pixel in this camera that looks at the scattered event in 3D space where my, where my mouse is at the moment, and it records that intensity at the time at which this pulse gets to the camera. Um, and then at a later time here, there's a different pixel that looks at this part of the, of the second event. There's a different pixel that looks at this location here. The, the time that we record for those two different pixels is related to the, the difference. You, you see these two wave fronts here. Those are um, not separated by that much. And they're not separated by that much because the light is traveling towards the camera. But there is a lateral shift. There is a lateral shift, yes. So, yeah, so, so there's a lateral shift. So that if I look at the data here, if I go like here, there's a, the beam, there's a beam on the left and there's a beam on the right. Yeah. yeah. A, a pixel looks at the beam on the left and a pixel looks at the beam on the right. Okay. Shall I, shall I move on? Yes. Okay. Uh, I realize I'm a bit short on time here, so I'm going to, I'll go through this a little quickly. Um, so we're looking at developing um, technology to see through uh, you, using our single photon detector array cameras to see through fog, snow, smoke, and now we're using radar to try to see through walls. And here's a reason Here's an example of, of where the visibility of a system significantly drops because of um, uh, scattering particles in the air. So we can think of uh, lots of reasons, other, other cases like this. We don't have access to helicopter, but we do have access to uh, miniature helicopters. So this is Sterling here, that's Alice on the right hand side. Sterling's the one that's flying it, the, the drone. And Sterling has been using the single photon detector cameras to uh, track and follow and monitor the orientation of, of drones as they are flying. So the idea here is that we have a target which we illuminate and we look at the back scattered light with our camera and the camera has extremely high temporal resolution so we can record the length of time that it takes for light to come back to the camera so we get 3D information. So here's an example of the, the data from our single photon detector array cameras where we're looking at depth imaging. This is Max waving his hands at the end of the corridor. So we're measuring depth at 25 frames a second at a distance of 50 meters away. So we are 
on the right hand side, that's just a regular intensity image. On the left, it's a depth image. Uh, so color represents distance in this case. And we get video rates, uh, depth images. So this is like a LIDAR system, but it's a very, very high resolution LIDAR system. Uh, it also works quite long distances. So this is an image that we took with a uh, zoom lens. Uh, and that's me at, in front of a um, storage container out at 500 meters. And that's the uh, image that we got back with our SPAD camera of, of depth. So you can see my hands, I'm holding my hands up in front of my face. Now, uh, I'll come back to improving the quality of these images. I just wanted to uh, show that they work out at quite long distances. So the experiment that Sterling has been doing is uh, taking our pulse laser, illuminating our drone, and using each pixel on the, on the SPAD. There is no, um, there's no lens in this case, but there is a lens in reality that images the, the, the drone to record depth. And we can also get simultaneous intensity. And he's been using a neural network to classify the orientation of the, of the drone. So this is our uh, system that he's built. This is a part of our field trials. This is the SPAD camera inside this box here. There's a lens and then you can see the laser illumination, that's Sterling there. The laser illumination going all the way out down our corridor, down 50 meters. So if we zoom in here, You see at the end of the corridor, there's a drone that's flying, hovering here. And if we were to actually look at what was happening at the end of the corridor, you'd see this drone here hovering around at a particular orientation. So the, the data that we get looks like this. This is intensity and depth. The depth is the top one. The intensity is the bottom one. And these uh, data go through a neural network, which classifies the drone at a particular orientation. So we get pitch, roll, and yaw for the drone. And we can also classify, we can do segmentation, which means capture, capturing the uh, orientation of the, of the, sorry, the location of its um, the engines and the propellers. And this is the results. These are actually simulation results. We're not quite yet at the point where we've got really good experimental data, but these are the um, simulated results. Intensity, top left, depth, top right, and then the yaw, roll, and pitch for the outcomes. You can see uh, we've got the red arrow, which is the prediction of our network and the blue, which is the ground truth. So we always have quite a good agreement between uh, the, the prediction and the ground truth. Okay, and in the last uh, five minutes, I'll, I'll explain what Alice is doing. So I think Alice's work is some of the most exciting because what we're doing is we're taking this data that we're collecting with our SPAD array camera. So SPAD is a single photon detector array. And we're improving the quality of this with computational imaging. So the resolution of these images isn't very good. It's uh, certainly not, not megapixels yet. But we can employ some pretty advanced um, processing methods to improve the quality of these images. So she published a piece of work last year, if you would like to have a look at it, on Optics Express, on uh, using a, a deep neural network for combining the um, depth and intensity information that our cameras give to increase the, uh, the spatial resolution of the, of the depth images. But the project that she's working on at the moment is in collaboration with a company called ST Microelectronics. And ST are a company that produce the sensors for our mobile phones. So they produce the, the time of flight depth sensors that are used in the latest Samsung phones. And they actually use, they make the sensor that's used in the Apple iPhone for the face ID sensor. We're not actually using that sensor. We're using the time of flight sensor 
which is used for auto focus assist and or augmented reality. So it works by uh, illuminating people like this and recording the time that light comes back. But the problem that the sensor has is it's, it's very, very low resolution. It's only four by four pixels. And uh, we've been working on methods to increase the resolution of that four by four system. So this is what the sensor actually looks like here. That, that small, tiny thing is the ST sensor, and it gives you a four by four array of the time of flight to a what, whatever it's looking at. It, even though you can't see it, there is a lens on that sensor as well, so that it forms an image. This is a Microsoft Connect uh, sensor, and I'm gonna show you the data, the type of data that we get from each of these things. So the, the, the Connect camera gives you very, very nice depth images but it costs around $400. The ST sensor gives you the distance to the target um, in, in a histogram and only costs a dollar. So what we've been working on are numerical methods to try to reach the resolutions of the Kinect camera through using a neural network. However, uh, we won't get quite to the resolution of the Kinect camera, but we'll show you something quite impressive. So th this is the goal. We take our time of flight sensor, which has got spatial, temporal and spatial data, and we're going to pass that to a computer, process that data, and give back the 3D pose of the people that are in the scene. And the, the neural network is trained to recognize how many people are in the scene, process that data, and give back a skeleton structure of what's going on. And you might think that even though the apparent resolution of the sensor is only four by four, we've got significantly uh, higher resolution at the end of the day. This is the structure of the network that we use for training, but I'm not gonna go into that. Someone can ask if they want. And here's the, here's the, the output. So there's quite a lot going on here. So I'll just take my time to, to show you. So there's the input that we take from the sensor, which is in the top left. There's the reference that we collect from the Kinect camera. And that's only used for the training of the network. It's not used when we actually process our predictions. And the output of our network has an increased resolution depth map, which is on the bottom left and a 3D reconstruction of where the person is. So if I play this video for you, you'll see that even though we start off with only four by four pixels, we can get to a much, much higher resolution at the end with our pixels to pose system. So if you want to compare the two depths, the reference depth is, is here, and we're able to record at about a 32 by 32 resolution, increased resolution depth map. We can use that depth map further to look at pose. It works for multiple people. So this is three people now. So this is the location of three people just from a sensor that only has four by four pixels. And if we want to compare this to um, the ground truth, and we can take our ground truth from the kinetic uh, system, we'll look at the video on the right hand side, we've got a very good overlap between the estimation and our ground truth. Okay, so uh, I just want to finish up there. I know that I've taken most of my time up now. Um, so I've given you a brief overview of what the PhD students uh, in my group are doing. Um, if anyone is interested in any, more of the, any, any more details of these projects, I'd be very happy to talk to you at a later date. I will be recruiting uh, new PhD students starting 
in 2022. So if anyone is looking for PhD places, then please contact me. Uh, I can't guarantee anything at the moment, but I certainly am looking for enthusiastic people who uh, are interested in the stuff that we're doing. If you want to go on to hwquantum.org, you can find further information about what we're doing here and you can find links to all of our publications. And I think that's my time. I'll finish there. Thank you very much, Dr. Ya, for the uh, invitation to talk. All right. Uh, thank you. Excellent. So again, uh, any any question? I, I think I have asked too many, so I think I'll let others ask. Um, then, yeah. then uh, so yeah, uh, questions. Yes, I have one. Okay, Abhinandan, go ahead. Uh, uh, can you just go to your uh, sorter slide where you have sorted uh, different spatial modes? Like this? Yes, yes, yes. So uh, here I think you have used a uh, number of reflections of four. So is it uh, fixed or it changes with the number of input modes? Ah. So yeah, so there, there, in, obviously in simulation, there's no limit to the number of reflections that you could use. Um, in principle, you can sort n arbitrary input modes with n reflections. So if you want to um, sort images, then you've got a set of it, a large set of images. You're going to have to have a large set of reflections. However, just because of the symmetry constraints, certain sets of modes are better for, are more suited to sorting than others. So Hermite Gaussian modes work much, much better than Lagarde Gaussian modes. So oh. you can sort a very, very large number of Hermite Gaussian modes with very few reflections. And in the NatureCom paper that uh, Joel, I was mentioning that Joel Carpenter did, in order to sort Lagarde Gaussian modes, they actually use an optical mode converter, a cylindrical lenses, to change between the Hermite Gaussian and the Lagarde Gaussian basis. So the answer to your question is, um, there are practical limitations into the number of reflections that we can actually achieve. People have done sort of seven, eight, nine reflections. We're using four in the lab at the moment. In, in oh. principle, you could go to more, but you're always trying to find uh, sets of modes that have particular symmetries that work for work nicely for sorting. And I know that Lagarde, Lagarde Gaussian modes are not, don't have that symmetry, but Hermite Gaussian modes do. And uh, you have then uh, also sorted different images that you yep. have given some input images also, you have sorted them. Yep. So is this uh, technology can be transferred to some communication protocols like where you just encode information in yeah. different so that, stuff? That's kind of, that's kind of our, our end goal and, and um, if you if you knew optical modes of a fiber, then you can sort those optical modes of a fiber. Um, absolutely, yeah. That 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 is it. That is the, the the goal here. In order to increase the capacity of communication systems, this is an optical system that allows you to sort general sets of modes. Yeah. Okay. And this, I think, these images are like. Uh from these are like spatially coherent modes. Uh, these yeah. also not modes. These are this intensity patterns. Sir. Yeah. So so right. so. If I if I play the, this this video for you here, this is all uh -huh. a coherent process. Okay. It's really nice to be able to sort incoherent modes, but I'm not sure how to do that at the moment. So okay. it, it 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 fundamentally is an interference effect. Yes, through, through clever diffraction and controlled interference. And if I don't have that, then I'm not sure what I can do. It's an interesting okay. question. Yeah, because uh, in uh, scattering or in uh, practical uh, communications, this uh, uh, turbulence will come into picture. So there are these coherent modes can uh, create some issue like speckles and all those things. Yeah. So in that uh, prospect is it like implementable with partially coherent or incoherent lights so. um i think it probably comes down to um like the coherence is like um 
you can think of it as as your as the non-orthogonal nature of your modes. Like, if you, the more incoherence you have, the the more non-orthogonal your states are going to become. So it might just manifest itself as a a change in the efficiency at which you can do the sorting. Um, okay. But I don't know. It's an interesting question. I mean, it's it's sort of on our radar of 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 how we can um, improve the the quality of the sorting. Okay. And uh, another thing regarding your imaging, so yeah, uh, I have a, yeah I have another question uh, in your uh, imaging slides uh, where you are doing imaging. Which Wait, imaging? Which one? Uh, this uh, time of flight. This video. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Here. Yeah. Huh. So in those situations, uh, how you get rid of any sort of speckle effects uh, because you are using a laser. Um, well, we, we, so in this case, it's an incoherent case. So even if I illuminate with my, the object with a coherent mode, the scattered okay. light that comes back is incoherent. So, um, we don't have any speckle effects in this case. It's actually oh. I mean, the laser, the laser that we're using in this case is actually a very, very multimode laser. So it doesn't have any speckle effects. Okay, 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 okay. Right. Okay, thanks.